Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, Fall 2009 Nokia Distinguished Lectures on Cyber-Physical Systems, uh, which is organized by CITRUS, the Center for Information Technology and Research in the Interest of Society, uh, and CCIT, the California Center for Innovative Transportation. Um, this lecture is organized by the Intelligent Infrastructure Cluster at Citrus, and it's currently being broadcasted on the other Citrus campuses, uh, UC Santa Cruz, UC Merced, and UC Davis. And if you are watching us online, you can IM us uh, your questions, and we will read them at the end of the talk. Uh, let me say a couple words about the Nokia Distinguished Lectures on Cyber-Physical Systems. These uh, lectures are funded by Nokia and focus specifically on topics to do with application of novel technologies to process, uh, to systems which uh, integrate uh, physical and computational processes. Uh, one good example of such uh, application is the Mobile Millennium Project funded by Nokia, which focuses on using cell phone information to reconstruct traffic flow. And if you're interested in this project, you can look at traffic.berkeley.edu, uh, which also has the full program of the cyber lectures. Um, before I introduce uh, this week's speaker, I want to say the next lecture will be uh, given by Professor Miroslav Kristic from UCSD on October 21st, and his topic will be uh, long actuator delays. Uh, so it's a pleasure for me to introduce this week's speaker, Professor Eric Ferron from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, Eric uh, received uh, his uh, bachelor from Ecole Polytechnique, alum uh, class of 86, um, and uh, master's from the Ecole Normale Supérieure and a PhD from uh, Stanford University. He has been a professor at uh, MIT for a number of years until he recently became professor at Georgia Tech. And in fact, I vividly remember when I was a student at Stanford, uh, Eric was this legendary professor from MIT who was uh, coming to give us talk and was the first one to show us how to fly a helicopter um, inverted uh, without a pilot. And so hopefully today uh, we'll find out how to uh, uh, enforce software and prove and verify it. Welcome, Eric. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Um, so I think uh, probably the only common point there is between uh, today's lecture and the activities uh, re related to uh, aerobatic flight of helicopters is that in both cases you will probably end up thinking I fell on my head. Um, I want to talk about this uh, control system software assurance problem. Um, well, and uh, I first uh, want to begin by giving you a uh, take-home message. So, you see, control theory is seen by those of you who are familiar with it but not necessarily involved in it as this science where a bunch of mad scientists keep uh, building up proofs of uh, good behavior of apparently very simple systems, uh, most often written in the form of differential equations. And, um, and people always wonder, okay, but why would you want to build such proofs? And what would you do with them anyway? Uh, the proofs may come from uh, such names and concepts as uh, Nyquist criterion, Lyapunov stability theory, uh, backstepping, if we're talking about design techniques, etc., etc. And uh, what I want the take home message to be is that those proofs can actually be rather useful when time comes to implement those systems in real life and uh, in fact serve our design work um, well by providing a sound floor under which we can uh, support and defend uh, our designs. So it is deliberately a uh, control perspective on system certification that I'm bringing uh, today. Uh, this perspective began for me around uh, about 1998, 1999, when a professor named Nancy Levison came from University of Washington, Seattle to MIT uh, in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And uh, she was explaining how safety was a central feature of complex 
systems. Uh, I, mean, I was uh, very much uh, taken by her, her enthusiasm. I say, well, you know, uh, if someone in computer science is so excited about showing and proving safety of uh, real-time systems, since I am by design a control system engineer, I should get interested in this. And um, it has been a, a very long time since I was or since I was able to do anything particularly useful uh, in the area of uh, software analysis, uh, which is, by the way, the reason why I wear a tie today. Uh, usually, uh, my wearing a tie is the sign of my trying to hide the uh, biggest kind of embarrassment. Um, so. Uh, I first tried to see, well, is there something in software that control people can help with? And um, the answer was a question mark for a while, up until um, I realized, no, I mean, there's really nothing that I can do specifically for software from a controls perspective, okay? So, but I mean, a better news was, was there something in software that, you can, that I could read that would be useful for control purposes? And uh, there I found pretty much nothing either. Uh, so I uh, uh, sort of downgraded my objectives to saying, well, maybe there is something about software systems that I can say about my implementation of control systems. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so uh, I will talk about uh, a simple uh, control design that we will use as an example or a benchmark. I will then raise the questions about stability and performance of these systems and then ask why should we worry about such questions at the level of the code rather than at the level of the equations that generated that code. Uh, in other terms, if I've got the equations of motion, if I've got the controller, why should I worry about the implementation of the controller? Um, I will uh, talk briefly about what I have found to be one of the most satisfactory uh, mechanisms by which we can say yes, and we can prove yes, such a piece of code works, okay? And uh, so this will be a very brief uh, introduction to Hoare logic. Um, which I will follow by a step-by-step -step analysis of a typical controller, trying to understand from a code analysis perspective how what we know about control systems can be useful. Uh, unfortunately, I did not finish uh, the work on closed-loop system analysis. Uh, so what you see is the last bullet being a promise which will not be fulfilled today. Um, so the simple control example is really simple. Uh, it is uh, the, the traditional, uh, almost boring, uh, mass spring control system, uh, whereby a mass of about one kilogram is attached to a wall via a spring of about, uh, with a spring constant of about one newton per meter. And, uh, the state of this system is the position and velocity of the mass while the control we can exercise on it is a force U. Okay. The equations of motion of this system are rather trivial. Uh, you see the spring effect appearing in the lower left corner of that matrix here. And uh, so this is the system that we propose to control. Okay. Uh, the idea behind showing this system is that I want to, to have like a piece of code and a piece of hardware present within the same presentation. Not necessarily within the same slide, but at least within the same presentation. So moving on, this is the transfer function of that system. Again, since it is for only for illustrative purposes, it is not a very uh, complicated system uh, to control. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, the transfer function of the system from input to output uh, looks like this, okay? Uh, you have a resonant mode at one radian per second, and the phase 
goes from 0 to minus 180 degrees following uh, the customary pattern. From a controls perspective, if you were to ask to design a control system for this thing, whereby you may want to uh, ask this mass to move to some pr uh, uh, predetermined location, uh, you may want to build that control system out of simple elements. If you are simply interested in damping out the motion of this system, then the control system could be absolutely trivial. Add a dash pot and make sure that the oscillations die out sufficiently quickly. Since we are interested in tracking some signal, uh, we make a slightly more compli complicated control architecture whereby we introduce a um, small uh, lead lag compensator uh, where the lead component is here, the lag component is here. The gain is adjusted in such a way that on the one hand the crossover frequency happens when the phase margin, that is the phase of the, up, uh, of the loop gain of the system is well above 180 degrees on the one hand and on the other hand the gain at low frequency is reasonably high thereby indicating good tracking properties for that system. Uh, on the other hand, because we're going to implement this guy on a computer, we cannot allow anything to enter this algorithm, okay, or this controller. Therefore, what we say is that whatever output of the system we measure, in that case the position of the system, we're going to pass through a saturation device before entering it into our computer, okay? in such a way that we don't have to worry about variable overflow. So, um, I want to point out that uh, provided that you don't, uh, provided that you don't uh, saturate uh, the input to the controller, okay, we have some uh, fairly uh, uh, good chances that for that system to be pretty good. Again, uh, good phase margin here indicates uh, it is translated into fairly low uh, overshoot when we're doing not exactly a step response but a half step response here, okay, and that high gain over there, okay, corresponds to good tracking properties uh, despite the presence of the spring, okay. Uh, so, let's see. Let's talk about the implementation of that controller, okay. Again, this is not uh, what I would call the most sophisticated implementation by far, but it will be enough to, uh, uh, to show my purposes. Uh, so the implementation of that controller will be uh, by basically generating maybe a simple state space representation of the system, of the, of the controller, okay? Uh, one such state space representation uh, is this one. Uh, I mean, it's very simple, only two states and um, it has a direct feed-through term indeed. Um, and uh, afterwards, the implementation is done by, well, discretizing this uh, differential e equation, okay, and generating a corresponding discrete time system. Here I picked an implementation at uh, 100 hertz. That should be enough given how fancy my system is, okay? So this is basically what ends up being our controller at the implementation level, okay? And um, I will focus on the analysis of that controller because the next step that we do is, uh, at least for those of you who have gone through a laboratory devoted to control systems uh, implementation, is, uh, well, to rewrite that controller as a C code of sorts. Now, there are two ways you can do it. Either you are courageous enough to write the C code yourself, and that was pretty much the way things were happening in the early 1990s when I was taking my own lab uh, courses, or today we would instead, uh, for example, code that uh, little system in a Simulink and then press the magic button, real -time, uh, the real-time workshop button that does the code generation, okay, out of that. And then what would come out is not this, but 100,000 lines of undecipherable garbage, okay, which nevertheless happens to work. Okay? Now, um, <laughs> happens to work, and what do we mean by happens to work? Uh, well, we mean 
that the controller, uh, once implemented, uh, will perform just about as well as the original design, which was a continuous time design. Uh, and uh, you know, the, once we hook that controller to the mechanical system, the mechanical system more or less exhibits uh, the uh, uh, right properties, uh, which is in that case a good tracking uh, system. Um, let's see. So we nevertheless have tons of other questions that arise uh, in the context of uh, these, uh, this uh, controller implementation. Okay. Uh, we could ask ourselves questions such as closed loop stability, closed loop performance, maybe presence of runtime er run errors or not, and maybe uh, at a different microscopic level, timing performance and, uh, for example, scheduling correctness in case our controller not only runs, uh, in case our computer not only runs controllers, but also maybe other functions as in the case of an aircraft flight uh, management computer, which also runs, of course, uh, the multi-functional uh, displays. Um, now, let's see, from a control perspective, I mean, this task, this set of tasks can be uh, uh, shown in that overall diagram, okay? So if we look at things from uh, uh, the beginning to the end, okay, uh, what we have is, uh, from a control perspective, we begin with a system identification slash validation, okay? Although for the system that we had at the end, that uh, phase was not uh, too difficult, let's face it. Uh, and uh, Andy knows that uh, this is not always true. Uh, the, uh, we come out with a system model, and what we do is we do a controller design, okay? And we do lots of control system analysis. What is that control system analysis that we're talking about? Well, it's a, a variety of things. It is, for example, what I uh, uh, showed when I said, oh, you know, I did my controller in such a way that my phase margin uh, was uh, such and such, my gain margin is such and such, and my low frequency gain is such and such. Okay, it could be other things, uh, such as my closed loop system is stable. How do you know that? Well, in the case when we can neglect the presence of the nonlinearity, we can say that all the eigenvalues of the closed loop system are somewhere either in the unit uh, 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 circle, in case uh, we're talking about discrete system, or in the left half plane, in case we're talking about a not so uh, discrete system. And uh, what we do is we end up doing many uh, iterative phases up until we basically, uh, our analysis is basically satisfied with our design, okay? And then from a control perspective, uh, we uh, forget about the rest, okay? So what's in the rest, okay? It is, uh, except maybe the last phase, which is like the controller is good to go. Then we're coming back in a rush, saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this thing, they're gonna implement my controller? I just can't believe it, okay? It took me seven years to design the 757 PID controller, and they're gonna implement it? I can't believe it, okay? So except for that, there's a whole bunch of other phases that I mentioned uh, that uh, um, uh, already, and I am repeating here, okay, which include so manual or autocoding, okay, followed by compilation, followed by verification, validation of the code, okay, that must be performed before we declare uh, the design good to go, okay. And typically, so as I said, from a control systems perspective, which is my perspective, while we spend a lot of time doing this, we don't bother much looking at any of that. In fact, uh, it, could be, it could be argued that in terms of what we teach to our students, we teach them how to do this really well, okay? And for that purpose, we teach them uh, concepts going as far as Lyapunov stability theory, um, nonlinear systems analysis, uh, robust control system analysis, etc., etc., all the way to the point where when we go into the lab, we say, okay, uh, does the response look like what the design was for? <laughs> so, in other terms, we revert to simulation to making sure that these things work fine, okay? And I don't say there is anything wrong with doing simulations. Uh, meaning that they certainly have valid points, okay, including 
and especially hardware in loop simulations. But however, it is kind of a shame in a way that we spend so much time talking about uh, fancy analysis methods here for control systems if it is to reduce uh, the f implementation phase down to a couple of simulations, checking that things are fine, okay, and then moving on uh, on that sole basis towards good to go. Okay? So here's the problem with this. Okay? Uh, the problem with this is that um, although up until relatively recently uh, there was not much uh, in terms of practical tools aimed at actually doing the formal verification and validation of the code that is being produced by mostly us, okay? This situation has changed a little bit. This situation has changed a little bit by means of the introduction of new static software analysis methods, okay? Um, and uh, some, of it com some of them coming straight out of uh, this very university, some of them coming out of uh, even Georgia Tech, uh, some of them coming on from France, and uh, one of the works I have been most familiar with in terms of practical methods for the analysis of functional software that ties to cyber physical systems, meaning uh, systems uh, I mean, systems, physical systems driven by software, is uh, the work uh, by uh, uh, Patrick Cousseau at Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. I don't claim this is the only work there is uh, that deals with this problem, but it is the one that uh, uh, I have been reading most about. And um, what uh, Cousseau came up with was in the late 1970s, a concept named abstract interpretation, okay? whose aim is to capture the semantics of programs in a computationally tractable way. Okay. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the consequences of this was in about 2003 and 2004, the ASTRE analyzer uh, that Cousseau's group came up with for analyzing basically the Airbus A380 autocoded control systems. Okay. Uh, that control system um, has grown from 20,000 lines on the Airbus A320 to close to 500,000 lines on the Airbus A380. Okay. All of which are related to the real-time control of that aircraft. And um, now, now here is the, the worrisome point. Okay, so uh, Cousseau uh, has a number of PhD uh, students and uh, I must say he's doing something very courageous. He lets his students publish in their own names and he basically races with them. If he publishes first, then they lose the scoop. Otherwise, they win. And in that case, a fellow named Ferre won. Okay, I wrote this paper named Static analysis of digital filters. Okay, uh, that was back in 2004, and uh, what this fellow wrote was about the best way to perform the analysis of the implementation of second-order filters, the software implementation of second-order filters. Okay, and we can read what's written. Uh, so a, second, uh, a simplified second-order filter, okay, that's fine. It looks like a second-order filter indeed uh, with uh, uh, a recursion uh, involving uh, the past two states. Uh, we experimentally observe that if we start from a given initial condition and provided that the input stream is bounded, then the, the states always lie in some ellipsoid. Okay? And moreover, that this ellipsoid is attractive uh, in other terms, that if you start on the boundary of that ellipsoid, you end up inside the ellipsoid. So in other terms, these folks, for the purpose of doing static software analysis of the A380, basically reinvented Lyapunov stability theory for their own purposes. So for me, 
that was more or less the time when I started thinking, okay, I mean, there definitely is something that we should be doing there, okay? And we should be thinking uh, maybe that, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, that, that we, sh we, should be, we should be finding a way to help, okay? Because these kind of concepts we knew ahead of time, okay? So why is it that they have to reconstruct such concepts as the happen of stability theory for the purpose of doing, uh, uh, of doing this uh, software verification, okay? So uh, this, is what, uh, this is what I want uh, to talk about, okay, which is uh, how, in fact, we can use control concepts and our understanding of control systems to better make sense of computer programs uh, which are the implementation of these control systems, okay? So that consists of asking uh, basically questions of the following kind. Where can the system go? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Okay? We know there are limits to what can be done. Okay? There are, uh, uh, there, 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 there are uh, uh, basically uh, theorems that tell us that it's not possible to answer these kind of questions for any computer program. Okay? However, things being as they are, we still need questions for some instance of the problems when things are tractable. And for that, we have a variety of options, okay? Uh, from a software analysis perspective, uh, some of these options include uh, techniques known as model checking, uh, horror logic for sequential programs, abstract interpretation, this is the material invent, uh, sort of promoted by uh, uh, Patrick Cousseau. And uh, what we want is to see the extent to which these methods, or at least a subset of these methods, can be uh, made uh, or can be helped by what we know in control systems. Okay. Uh, before moving on to Hoare logic, which is what I'm uh, mostly interested in, I want to give a quick description of the desirable attributes of a program proof. So, for many years, uh, I had been wondering, uh, what does it mean to have a proof of a program? Say, as opposed to the proof of whatever else, uh, a proof of stability of a given dynamical system. What does it mean that we have the proof of a program? And uh, I was rather confused up until, uh, of course, somebody pointed me to uh, the appropriate textbook and uh, indicated to me the following, that, well, a program proof, in order to be recognizable as such, must be, on the one hand, expressive enough that you can tell non-trivial statements about your program. And I think the most, uh, uh, the most interesting point is that it must be elementary enough so that in a way, if you read one element of the proof, okay, you can understand that one element of the proof by looking at only a small subset of the program whose properties you're trying to establish. Okay? In other terms, um, if I tell you, uh, okay, well, such property holds, but for me to understand this proper, uh, but that for me to understand this property, I must look as the pro at the program as a whole. Chances are that I'm not going to be able to make sense of it. At the specification level, there is at the description of a dynamical system level. Sure, no problem. Uh, we are trained to that, and we uh, year after year train our students to do that. We are given a matrix A, a matrix B, a matrix C, and a matrix D. And we can extract tons of properties of the corresponding continuous or discrete time system. However, for programs, uh, this is different. As I said, the program implementation could be by means of an autocoder, in which case you will not recognize anything about anything uh, on a local basis. You look at the program and say, I don't understand what this variable is for. I don't understand what this, uh, what this transition is for. I don't know what this multiplication comes about. Okay. And so it is very important to be able to uh, verify the, that 
uh, and to understand the proper behavior of the system by understanding teeny bits at a time, okay? And hope that once these teeny bits are stacked up on top of each other, okay, they basically compose themselves into a macroscopic statement about the system that is indeed clear, useful, and understandable. All right? So uh, this is what, uh, um, this is what um, uh, Huang logic does for us, okay? And uh, uh, it, well, what, what it does is basically tells for each line of the program, okay, it's a restricted subset of all kind of programs, but it's a subset that's expressive enough to capture everything, okay? It tells us, it, it gives us a mean to understand what the program does on a line-by-line -line basis by basically equipping each line, for example, an assignment, okay, with a statement about what the state space was like before that line and what the state space became after the execution of that line. Okay, so think about it. If each line is, if you, if you examine each line one by one, okay, and, um, and you equip each line by means of a statement about what the, the, the state was before the execution of that line and a statement about what the state is after the execution of that line, okay, then I can, for example, combine lines together and understand what two lines succeeding each other could do, as long as, of course, some conditions are satisfied between w what I can say about the state space of the system after uh, the execution of the first line and the state space of the system before I execute the second line, okay? M uh, precisely that these statements must imply that statement, or in other terms, that the set in which the state space, the, 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 the set or approximation of the set where the state space belongs, uh, here must be a subset of, uh, 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 of, of uh, the, the uh, literally precondition, okay, that applies before uh, the second line of code. And so what you have here is exactly what I was after, at least, which is a uh, composable environment whereby I can build my proof line by line, okay, it doesn't mean that the way I'm going to it doesn't mean that the way I'm going to build my proof is only going to rely on individual lines. Okay, the way I'm going to build my proof might require some hindsight. Okay, but but to understand that proof, you only need to check that these two statements are compatible through that line. These two statements are compatible through that line. This statement implies that statement. And then you can compose these two into a bigger statement about these two lines. Now imagine you have 100,000 lines of these, okay? If you can start doing this, okay, for every line, and you have a long chain of compatible statements, then you can, in fact, tell everything you want to know about what happens to your state space. So now, uh, what happens to your state space as it goes through that program? So, uh, for example, uh, what we can do is look at the behavior of the controller under the inputs. Okay, so that's a very simple thing because we're not even looking at the closed loop system stability. We're just looking at the behavior of the controller. What we would like to be able to do is, for example, say, well, could we bound what the state of the controller belongs to as the input here varies within whatever uh, range? Okay, and uh, can I bound where this control variable here, um, <coughs> where this variable, the control variable here could go as the input goes wherever it wants? From a system's perspective, this is, uh, uh, this question has been uh, stabbed to death, okay? And um, um, one of the mechanisms by means of uh, Lyapunov functions, okay, uh, whereby what we say is we are able to prove via some, uh, 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 via some mechanisms that I don't want to expand upon right now that the following ellipsoid, okay, where uh, of the form x transpose px less than one where p is that matrix, okay, the following ellipsoid is invariant, meaning if you start inside the ellipsoid, you stay inside that ellipsoid, okay? So that's the argument 
that's being chosen by controls people uh, from, a, uh, from a controls perspective. And uh, we can more or less uh, add afterwards that therefore none of the entries of the state here will exceed seven in size and therefore say all sorts of things about uh, uh, this. Now, how can we transfer that knowledge to the program that implements that controller? How much time have I got, by the way? Okay. Um, so how do I do that? Well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, a MATLAB implementation of that controller. Okay, why do I talk about MATLAB implementation? It's because a MATLAB implementation that's at the same time close enough to a program that it actually executes on, uh, on uh, most computers uh, in engineering, and at the same time it's sufficiently close to the system that we understand what happens. Okay? And uh, so here's a, a little implementation of our controller in MATLAB. Okay? And uh, what we're going to do is we are going to indeed apply uh, this method developed by HOAR, okay? But how are we going to, uh, to, to, to understand how the system uh, uh, works, okay? And to understand that indeed this program implements the controller that we've been talking about, okay? And that this program has the same, to be more precise, has the same characteristics, okay? That the state remains bounded, okay? So for example, uh, uh, that this state here remains bounded, okay? So how do we do that in a more mechanical fashion? Well, um, I mean, here we have to have some insight, okay, um, uh, to begin with. And the insight that, uh, that I propose to say is, well, you know, we did that analysis with uh, the control system uh, before, okay? I know this ellipsoid is invariant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that as a guide to write the proper set of comments that I'm going to put uh, 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 around each line of that code, okay? Uh, in such a way that now, instead of proving that the, the specification is correct, that I prove that the program is correct. So the statement I can say is like, well, somehow I have a hunch that this guy X here is going to be bounded by the same ellipsoid, of course. I mean, it's a, it's a MATLAB implementation of the very same thing, okay? So what I'm going to do is, well, I'm not going to start here. I'm going to start there instead, okay? And I'm going to say, well, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to use that information, so it's information I, I have in hindsight, and I'm going to start by commenting this line here. I say, so u is equal to c times x plus d times y, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to surround these by statements that look a, pro, uh, a priori, rather arbitrary, but come from a previous analysis. I'm going to say, well, y here is the input to the system. I can see that it's been saturated before. Okay, so my y is less than 1, okay? So I put that statement here, okay? Then I say, okay, my x, all right, so that's probably my state. All right, I'm going to say it belongs to that ellipsoid, okay? Uh, ellipsoid EP, which the set of x such that x transpose px is less than 1, okay? And I'm going to look at what this guy does across this line. Okay, well, across this line, what, what is the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, we just have u is equal to uh, c times x plus d times y. So what we're going to say is, well, x has not been changed across that line. On the other hand, we have u. Okay, and we can, we can do, an, I mean, we can do basically a, uh, a, a, a simplified analysis uh, that will lead us to conclude, just based on that, uh, on that line here, that u square has to be less than uh, this quantity here, where c, p, and d are, in fact, a bunch of numbers. Okay, so this is an actual number. And, of course, y remains less than 1, and we have not done any operation on y. Okay, so we start here. At the beginning, it looks pretty mystifying. Why should we put these kind of statements, which are statements by the state space of our system, actually a bit more than the state space of our system, because we see y here, which is the input to the system, okay? In the program, I mean, I'd rather make it a state of the system. We see u here that appears as well, okay? So this statement, again, I say, if I'm building the proof, I'm, I don't necessarily need to, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I, I can use hindsight to, to put these elements together, what is the most important thing? The most important thing is that once these statements are in place, an independent proof checker can look at these and say, I think this guy and that guy are compatible with each other through that statement. And that does not require any other knowledge than the local knowledge here about that line. Okay? And of course, we assume we know the values of C and D. Okay? So where do we go from there? Well, of course, one of the things that we tend to do is say, 
Well, either we start from here, okay, and we see what happens to it through that next line, or we start from there and we see what happens to it when we go backwards, okay? As it turns out, it is easier to go backwards than to go forward, okay? And so what we do is we first go backwards. We go backwards one step and we see, okay, so what does that line do uh, to us? Well, that, that line transforms Y, okay? It's transforming Y from a shapeless thing down to something well, uh, well uh, form, uh, formatted, okay, Within, be, between minus one and one, okay? So it is pretty easy to see that when we go through that step, what we're going to do is we're going to conserve this guy, but this guy here will basically go nowhere, okay? Meaning that whereas after this guy, this line executes, we can say this, before we could not say anything, okay? And so what remains is, well, you know, we, ha we certainly have a Y, but it's not even worth mentioning it, okay, because it could have any value. On the other hand, we still have X uh, belongs to its uh, ellipsoid because uh, that's what we, uh, 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 that, that, that's what, uh, I mean, nothing happened to X here, so the, the best thing to do is to propagate this thing backwards, okay? And so what we have here is now two lines, okay, together with comments about them in such a way that uh, if my initial assumption here about this set of comments on line eight were correct, okay, then, then we can say that if X belongs to the ellipsoid at the end, well, here's what happens at the end, okay? Now, of course, what is the next step? Well, is to go to line before. Line before is just the introduction of Y, okay? So it is fair to say that state space Y doesn't do much, except maybe ex introducing the existence of Y, okay? So I just changed it. I, I just uh, did not do anything here. I just said, well, you know, that line did nothing to my state, so X belongs to the same ellipsoid, okay? Now here I reach a very interesting part of the program since I have a loop, okay? So how does a loop work? Well, a loop really doesn't consist of a single line, but it consists of one line here and one line there, okay? And what I'd like to do is say, well, under what condition uh, do I have this? Uh, I mean, under what, I mean can, what can I say about the state space, sorry, uh, uh, as far as that loop is concerned, okay? Well, there are two things that can happen, okay? The loop, so that line, he has reached either from the line before here or from the line there, okay? So if we propagate backwards, what does that mean? That means that as we go through this, okay, we can say that, well, if X was in this ellipsoid after that while command executed, that means he must have been in that ellipsoid before, okay, over here, or over there, okay, just before we're about to loop around. Okay, so that introduces again, uh, I mean, this is still a, a relatively mechanical uh, pr a propagation, this mechanical propagation mechanism that comes straight out of a uh, standard textbook in uh, uh, theoretical computer science, okay, which tells, us, uh, which tells us how to propagate this guy. Now, this guy here falls, it happens to be so because, well, since it's an infinite loop, we never get to that state anyway, or uh, to that stage of the program anyway, okay? That's, uh, uh, controller programs don't like to stop, okay? So what we are now bound to do is, on the one hand, explore backwards this guy, which is relatively trivial, and explore, on the other hand, that guy, which is less trivial, okay? And uh, what we, uh, so what we do is just this guy, okay, here. We just introduced the state. Before that, there was nothing, okay? There was just the matrix A, B, C, and D. So I summarized that by saying, well, before the world was, okay, before the, we had a state, we were in, in condition true, okay? And then the same thing happens afterwards, uh, I mean, from, now, from, from there on, okay? So we just say, okay, true, true, true. So I, I can stop there, okay? And go back here instead of saying, so the next opportunity I have is to go backwards to here and say, okay, so what happens? Okay, so the predecessor of my line number five is really line number 10, okay? And what does my line number 10 say? Well, it says, okay, so... Uh, X belongs to that ellipsoid. But line number 10 is X is equal to AX plus BY, okay? So what I do in order to understand what happens, uh, uh, how this statement can be transformed into a proper predecessor is by simply replacing X by its value, okay? So since X is equal to AX plus BY, that means that if I replace X by its value here, I have AX plus BY in that ellipsoid, okay? And by the way, since Y appeared, 
I'm going to uh, I'm going to arbitrarily introduce that y square is less than one. Okay, and that comes from hindsight about the rest of the program. But you can see that indeed, if this is true, then through that assignment, then that is true. Okay, and keeping going backwards like that, we get to line nine. And it's at line nine that something interesting happens because on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, when you propagate this guy backwards, you would say, okay, well, I propagate, I, I propagate this guy backwards and uh, since all what I've done is I've printed out my u here, pretty much nothing has happened to x, so I have ax plus by still in that ellipsoid, y squared still less than one. I just add, since now I, I, uh, I have the existence of u, that u squared is less than two cp inversely transpose plus d squared. Okay, so that's what happens, that's what results from a backward propagation. Okay, but from a forward propagation perspective, we have a different things happening, which is that uh, which is that uh, uh, we must have this statement holding, okay, and that must lead us to that statement afterwards. And of course, these two statements here are a priori at odds with each other. They're not the same statement, okay. In order to make them talk to each other, we want this statement to become uh, to imply that statement, okay. And guess what? That is an invariance property on the ellipsoid P, ellipsoid P, okay, because we take x. We map it through uh, this mapping, okay? And what we want is that if x belongs to the ellipsoid, then it also belongs to the ellipsoid there. That came, for f that came from our system analysis, okay? That came from our system analysis, okay? Uh, I mean, or that presumably came from our system analysis uh, before, okay? And what that leads us to doing is basically uh, doing the last link. Between, uh, uh, between the beginning of our analysis and the end of our analysis, okay, by saying, well, this statement implies that statement, and therefore I can build, uh, uh, sorry, I can build a, uh, uh, a, a, a complete program documentation, okay, that tells you step by step all what happens to the program once, uh, what, all what happens to the program uh, uh, in a provable way. Now, there remains, nevertheless, one tricky point. Okay, this one. Okay, so how do we prove this implies that? So we could take it, <laughs> we could take it and say, well, Andy Packard said that it was true. Okay, and, uh, uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, that wouldn't be very satisfactory, okay, as a proof. So the level of proof that you want to introduce there, okay, to support that, varies as a function of the level of sophistication that your theorem prover or your proof checker will have. Okay? On the one hand, if your proof checker is not very sophisticated, then you're going to have to help with the proof. And in particular, that helps. Here comes from the introduction of the auxiliary statement, which is this one. Okay, name S procedure uh, among, uh, among the controls people. Okay, which says, well, it turns out that for all X and Y, this guy is always less than zero. Okay, I will skip the details about how it works. Okay, but it only suffices to see that uh, when you add that statement, in fact, it makes proving this thing, uh, proving this thing, sorry, this thing from that thing, okay, much easier. On the other hand, if you have a sophisticated prover, okay, what, is, what, uh, what could it do? Well, maybe it could take this kind of inequalities and say this kind of inequalities leads me to that kind of inequalities, okay? And guess what? Some people in the formal methods community have just implemented solvers, basically uh, provers, that have enough expressive and computational power to prove these things automatically. In other terms, they have developed, they have hooked to their provers uh, things such as uh, SOS tools, uh, which are tools aimed at solving systems of polynomial inequalities. If you look at this, these two guys, uh, sorry, these two guys and these two guys, they are systems of polynomial inequalities indeed. So that presumably, if you write this, the prover would be able to go from that statement to that statement and able to prove that this statement indeed implies that statement. Okay, so since I'm running out of time, I want to stop here and tell you uh, what we get in the end. Well, in the end, what we get is 
by leveraging one thing about our computer, uh, our control system, which is our knowledge about how to prove, for example, uh, uh, the invariance of a certain ellipsoid at the macroscopic level, we can come up with a, uh, sorry, a, uh, eventually a full documentation of our control system and of our controller. In which case, and that full, implement, uh, that full documentation basically consists of logical statements about the state space of the system as it goes through every single step of the program. Now, people might argue, yeah, but we know the only important thing that is in that program is this guy and that guy. Uh, which one? Uh, and that guy here. Okay? And the rest is basically uh, updating, bookkeeping, etc., etc., etc. Okay? But try and explain that to a formal computer prover. Okay? It is much easier to come up with these statements, acknowledging that the only difficult ones are those, okay? and document your programs that way in order to eventually uh, be able to better reach to the people who will do eventually the validation of the system. In fact, we can think of these procedures as uh, uh, two possible, uh, for, uh, we can think of them as uh, two possible ways. So I'm sorry, these two guys have appeared and they vanished. Okay, so I, knew, I need to uh, go a little fast. And we can think of two ways. Okay, one way, for example, would be the following. Imagine that uh, you're, uh, so imagine that the, the control system community takes its responsibilities. Okay, then we could have uh, oh, no, actually it doesn't take its responsibility, sorry. Then uh, what we could imagine is that we all work with, uh, still with uh, the good old ways. We do our control specifications. We throw them into Simulink. We spit out an autocode. Okay? And then we could basically lay the work on the shoulders of uh, the analyzer, the program analyzer. Okay? In which case, the program analyzer needs not only to come up uh, <coughs> with a proof that the system works well, but it must come up with all the statements, okay, that documents each line one by one, okay, that supports that proof, okay? And so that's a lot of work, that's, but that's what's necessary if uh, autocoders remain the way they are now, today. Okay, the alternative, which I think is better, is a, a credible autocoder, okay, whereby you could think of our writing the control specifications together with the proof, into a simulating diagram, then a modified autocoder would, would immediately provide the documented autocode. What, what I mean by documented, I mean the source code together with the statements that say, that say exactly what happens to the state space on a line-by-line -line basis in such a way that an independent proof checker belonging, for example, to the certification authority can take this guy, look at it, and say, yeah, the proof is correct. Okay? So, um, in the, these two, I mean, there, these are two possibilities. This one requires more work at this level. This one, uh, at the level of the analysis. This one requires more work at the level of the uh, of the autocoder writing. Okay, I know of no autocoder that does that now, and uh, but provided that we can uh, we can provide either one of these jobs, at least we have made uh, the certification job easier on us. Uh, so uh, I want to conclude by saying that. Uh, the, the main observation uh, of the presentation is stability and performance proofs for control systems fundamentally are fundamentally compatible with formal analysis and verification methods, okay? And uh, that, therefore, we should do it, okay? You're going to say, it's trivial. Okay, well, all the more, okay? If, it, if it's trivial, we should, even, we should do it even more, okay? Uh, and uh, I also want to uh, uh, conclude by acknowledging support from uh, the NSF and uh, NASA and Northeastern University. Thank you. So it's been a pleasure to have you here, and in the tradition of the uh, Nokia Distinguished Lectures on Cyber-Physical System, we'd like to... Phone? <laughs> no, no phone, no phone. <laughs> but we'll give you this plaque instead. Wow. Um, so we're going to open the um, floor to questions for Eric, if anybody has a question. Uh, Andy. So in the proof, it seemed like you really proved one property that uh, in right. ellipsoid was invariant. So that was one of the properties that you knew about the controller. Right. And the code proved it. So the same, if the statement just said x equals zero inside the loop, that would have also uh, been able to prove. So it doesn't seem like the code is correct. It's not incorrect in the way that the state cannot leave the ellipsoid. 
Yes, so in that case, the proof that we're establishing is just that the variables are never going to go berserk. Okay, right, in other words, I could, have, I could have had the wrong A and B matrices in there, oh, I could but have the, the ellipsoid could have still been absolutely. invariant. Absolutely. And the yes. prover could have proved that the ellipsoid was invariant. Yes. So, what you, so you want to establish a bunch of... So from a control perspective, it's, that, I mean, it's the, the first epsilon step okay. in analyzing a system. Okay, I don't know if the system will uh, be good, but it won't hurt. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is exactly what, uh, uh, this is exactly where formal analysis of software lies as far as Jetliner is concerned, Jetliner analysis is concerned. Okay. okay. So of course, after that, we want to say, okay, so, so we would like to prove that the closed loop system works, okay? And now we have to develop ellipsoids uh, that take the state of the plan and the state of the uh, uh, controller uh, together and, the, and realizing that these two sort of run in parallel. So we have sort of concurrent programs mm -hmm. running, but I haven't had time to present this today. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've not come here today to discourage you from doing what you're doing because it's something I've also been trying to do for, let's see, 55 years. That's how long I've been programming computers. But you've overlooked three fatal weaknesses. The first weakness has to do with the underlying system, which does not always do what you think, nor what it claims. Let me give you an example with MATLAB. MATLAB has an operation called round. It rounds a number to the nearest right. integer. For 10 years, two versions of MATLAB on PCs, but not on Macintoshes, they didn't suffer from this problem. On PCs, the act of rounding an odd integer in a certain interval would actually increment it. It wasn't discovered for more than 10 years. There have been other such bugs in MATLAB. These bugs are extremely difficult to find because they are caused by the second weakness in the system that you've described, and that is the presence of rounding errors. You see, your matrices A and B and C and D are not what actually act on the vectors X and the scalar Y. Something else happens called round off. And if you wanted to use the polynomial inequality techniques that have been developed over the past many years, you would have to include the rounding errors and the bounds for them. This would not invalidate the techniques. It would merely increase the dimensionality of the problem to so large a dimension as to run you out of memory on the biggest machines that we have. This problem with round off is particularly annoying. And if you look at my web page, you'll see that, in fact, we're plunging into a regime of computation where, partly because of parallelism and its influence on our choice of algorithms, we are unable to debug our codes. They are so huge. They run so fast. They do a billion operations in a second or less. How can you single step through that with the present debugging tools? So these are the first two signal weaknesses. The third, unfortunately, is much more problematical. It has to do with the act of translating the mathematical relationships and the physical relationships that you think that you're serving into a language that your system verifier understands. Now, this has torpedoed many verifications. Let's look at Hoare's scheme. I think um, there was a language, it was called Occam, if I remember rightly, and there was a verifier that went with it. And in 1986, an attempt was made to use it to prove uh, that the INMOS transputer had correctly implemented floating point. Now, it turns out that it hadn't. And the reason it hadn't was partly an intentional step on the part of the engineers who designed it. But the verifier didn't realize that. And the person doing the verification made two mistakes, which invalidated his verification. 
only one of them happened not to matter. A similar thing happened to... I'm to sorry, I'll, I'll have to interrupt, but maybe you can converge to a question, or uh, we'll take the interaction offline, but maybe... Um, well, okay, it's just the translation layer is not one layer, it is many. And there are ample opportunities for mistakes in that translation, and we don't know how to prevent those mistakes. Um, let me answer uh, your comments by further comments. First of all, uh, I agree 100% with uh, everything you have said. Uh, these come at no surprise to me. Uh, talking about uh, the analysis of something such as MATLAB or a MATLAB program, uh, I meant it as, a, uh, a, as an example because uh, it was close to the language of engineers while remaining close to, to, uh, um, to, uh, to um, uh, I mean the programming world. Now that being said, even C can be ambiguous and can have like bad definitions of, uh, of certain operations. And so what happens is that doing a verification at a certain level of description of the system only does what it says it does, which is verification at that level. Li literally, in order to have a uh, tool uh, that would be usable by the community, uh, by, for example, the FAA or other uh, risk-sensitive or risk-adverse agencies, we would really need to do the implementation, so the analysis of the specification, the analysis of the source code, the analysis of, uh, all the way down to the analysis of every single, all this, I mean, the, 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 the sequence of operations that is performed by the processor, at that point we hope, and you, you started mentioning the Pentium processor, we hope that somebody else will have done the, the job bottom up from the physics of the processor all the way up to the elementary operations so that the two analyses can join and eventually get uh, what we want. Uh, talking about uh, round of errors, yes, they are extremely vexing. Uh, and um, and uh, there, there was a tactical move on my part. So quite a few people work on the prime of Randolph analysis. And one of the fellows that I've been uh, looking at and following is, uh, um, I, I, I apologize for my uh, horrible French. His name is Eric Goubeau. Uh, he works at the Centre d'Etude Atomique in Paris. And uh, he has been working extensively on, uh, on uh, Randolph errors. So extensively that I thought, Okay, I stand no chance in that direction. I'd rather stay, I'd rather stay my uh, course, uh, my little course and control system and see what part I can bring. However, it would be bringing some part to, uh, 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 to a, 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 a construct which otherwise escapes my, uh, my competence. I can only bring one element to it. Okay. Well, actually, if you enlarge your ellipse a little bit, it would have allowed for the rounding errors particular programming shows. Right, that's possible. But again, I just start, I just start, I mean, the way to do it rigorously and things like that. I, I, really, got, I, I really got the sinking feeling that w I would be able to find it somewhere, maybe in the literature. And that depressing thought got me moving in another direction. <laughs> that's all. So, uh, um, uh, so anyway, I mean, I, I hope these, uh, these reassure you as to uh, the, the purity of my intents and also uh, the limited scope of uh, w uh, my contributions. Very good. We're going to stop here in the interest of time, but I want to thank our speaker again for his talk and his answer to the question.